So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the class. We begin with a quotation from uh, Masivash Bandhu in his text uh, Abhidharma, on the Abhidharma, where he says, uh, I prostrate to the great teacher who uh, liberates uh, uh, sentient beings from the mud of cyclic existence. So, first of all, we have to consider how do we obtain the type of bodies that we have, life after life, within cyclic existence. It is always established through the force of karma and afflictions. And because it is established in this way, we constantly go through the experiences of birth, aging, sickness, and death. So cyclic existence in this verse is likened to the mud. So we have fallen into the mud. Now, you know, if an animal sinks into mud, even let's say like a horse, a mighty horse, if it falls into the mud, it is very difficult from its own power, even if it is a powerful animal, to rise or to come out of the mud. If you're sinking in the mud, you need the help of someone who can pull you out. So in our situation, we have fallen into the mud. We are sinking into the mud of cyclic existence, but we we don't have the power to uh, extract ourselves from it, but we can rely on the teachings or of our uh, gurus, our spiritual friends, who give us the teachings of um, Buddha Shakyamuni. And then through listening, contemplating, and meditating on these teachings, we can come out of this. We know that Buddha Shakyamuni gave all those teachings, and then the teachings were preserved, explained, propagated by a great number of um, great masters, panditas in India, in China, and so forth. And these teachings are teachings that have the power to liberate someone from all the suffering of cyclic existence and gradually lead them to the state of Buddhahood. So this is why Master Vashbandu says, I bow or I prostrate to the teacher who gave those teachings, right? Because our teacher, Buddha Shakyamuni, has given those teachings on the Four Noble Truths, the 16 aspects of the Four Noble Truths on emptiness and so forth that have these liberating powers. And it is through this that we obtain the precious human rebirth. And we have right now the opportunity to come and study the Lamrim and do various practices and so forth. So imagine if we were in a completely different uh, situation, different environment. Imagine if we were in a place in the world where there was war. Actually, there is war at this present moment raging so imagine you and all your family and so forth being involved or being being reborn in a place where there is war and conflict we must always pray that we will have a, a type of rebirth that will will not we will never be involved we'll never have to experience this situation so um it is uh, very important to consider how the influence that the three poisons, the afflictions, have in our mind constantly. Now, the fact that in this life we have come with a body that is uh, functional or our senses are complete, our speech is coherent, our understanding is pretty good, we have pleasant expression and so forth. All of this is actually the result of what we have done in our previous lives. There is that saying uh, that says that if you want to know what your past life was like, look at your present body. And if you want to know what your future life will be like, look at the state of your mind. So it is very important to always remember the kindness of our previous lives. Whatever we practice, whatever we established in our previous lives became the causes to bring us now in this life with this uh, perfect set of conditions, the perfect uh, body, intelligence, all the senses functioning and so forth. All right, sorry, we got disconnected. <laughs> okay, um, so um, we were saying that if you want to uh, know what your past life was about, you have to look at the present life. So when you look at all the privileges um, that you have all the privileges, the good appearance, the perfect understanding, or this all the senses working in this life, uh, you will understand that all of this is the result from our previous lives. Um, 
many times uh, we are not we do not fully appreciate how things change how things could change uh, momentarily um um even phenomena and also our own body how they change moment by moment so um I guess what I was saying, it's uh, happened, you know, in the past where people uh, didn't have uh, very much wealth and perhaps they could not have a mirror. And it happened so that someone had not seen his face for a very long time in a mirror. And that person kept thinking, you know, I'm still young, I, I'm still presentable and so forth. And in one occasion, the person happened to go to a restaurant and there was a mirror there, you know, where you wa wash your hands and there's a little mirror there. And then he got a sight of his face in the mirror and he got a shock because, of course, you know, he saw how different he looked from what he thought he still looked, right? And it's the same with all of us. We all think I look or I am the same way I was, I don't know, 10 years ago. I haven't changed and so forth. Whereas in, in reality, we do. We change all the time. So the important thing to keep in mind here is that what we have in this life is the result of previous lives. And it is important that we create the causes so that we can continue to have the opportunity to practice the Dharma in our future lives. We can practice so that we can generate all the realizations of the stages of the path in our next life. So when we look at all those great beings, such as, for example, our, our teacher, Buddha Shakyamuni, the great masters such as Nagarjuna and so forth, and all the other great masters, it is not the case that they had a perfect bodhicitta, perfect realization from the very beginning. No, they started as ordinary beings the same way that we are. Actually, a lot of them, they also had to take rebirths as animals, as uh, insects and so forth. We know in the case of Buddha Shakyamuni, we have a record of 500 pure rebirths and 500 impure rebirths. So it took a lot of rebirths to gradually progress along the, the path and reach the state of Buddhahood. Okay, so um, it is... Um, very important, as we say here, to um, always uh, remember uh, death, death and impermanence. Now, sometimes in the West, there, there is, um, you know, people don't want to contemplate this subject. However, in Tibetan Buddhism, we bring it up again and again. We discuss death and we discuss death uh, in um, uh, on the basis of three principles. First of all, that death is certain. Secondly, that de the actual time of death is uncertain. And thirdly, that at the time of death, only Dharma can be of benefit. The reason why we want to remember death, we want to discuss death, is because it becomes a motivator for our practice. And it's very important to always practice. It's very important to always engage Dharma practice because, as we say, at the time of death, uh, we will all die. We do not know exactly when we die. But when the time of death happens, the thing that is most crucial is the imprints that we have in our minds. Whether these are imprints of heavy negativity or whether these are imprints of uh, great virtuous activities, these are the only things that have the power when they're activated to project us or to push us into our next rebirth. And therefore, it is so important to do Dharma practice. And in order to do Dharma practice, we need to rely on a spiritual teacher. Okay, so as the Lamrim says, um, the, when it discusses the subject, it talks about the, how to rely on the spiritual master, the root of the path. So relying on a spiritual master is the method that will allow us to eventually generate all these realizations and reach the state of Buddhahood. So we're talking here about this whole concept of relying on a teacher, on a master. Obviously, it is something very important in the context of Buddhism, but also it's very important in secular education. Anything that you want to train in, anything that you want to learn, you have to rely on a teacher. And we see that 
when you go into a classroom and you have someone who is a teacher who is, you know, obviously they're doing this as a job. They are paid to come every day and teach the kids. Uh, but if that teacher has some good motivation to to benefit the students, to help them for the rest of their lives, to give them um, whatever tools they need to be successful in life, then you can see that uh, this can bring about great results in terms of education. So we understand this concept of relying on a teacher in the secular context. And of course, in Buddhism, it's very important. These words in the Lam Rim that say relying on the spiritual master, the root of the path, the root of the path indicates that it's something very crucial. And in the Lam Rim, we have this analogy that says, imagine that you have a mighty tree. Everything that you have growing in that tree, from the stem of the tree, the branches, all the leaves, all the flowers, the fruits, whatever will appear on that tree, whatever will grow on the tree, actually comes from the roots. Okay, so this uh, puts the whole importance of the spiritual teacher in place. And it's very important because if we rely on the teacher properly and follow the advice of the spiritual teacher, uh, we will progress and it, it, by means of having precious human rebirth again and again and again until we reach the state of Buddhahood. So the term for that in Tibetan is uh, the virtuous friend. And virtues here indicates that uh, this teacher is a teacher that pushes us towards virtue. So it is a person who has taken on this very grave responsibility of taming our mind, any improper states of mind that we have, unruly states of mind, they will discipline and they will uh, lead us towards virtue, eventually leading us all the way to enlightenment. So this is the proper understanding of the term, the virtuous friend. Um, so, or the spiritual teacher, if you want. Otherwise, we use the word teacher quite a lot in, you know, in the general sense and so forth. <clears throat> so, we talk about um, relying on the practice of the Lamrim or engaging the practice of the Lamrim. That type of reliance has the power to bring about happiness in this life, happiness in future lives, and eventually lead us to the state of liberation and omniscience. So how does the practice of the Lam Rim actually makes us happier in this life? We know that what spoils happiness is uh, the afflictions that we generate. So if you are a practitioner of the Lam Rim, at the beginning of the day, you will certainly have this recollection about afflictions and you will set up your mind to say afflictions is what ruined me, what ruins my happiness, and I will try my best to minimize those. And as soon as the, an affliction is generated, I will try to recognize it and avert it. So this is the result of Lam Rim. So you will minimize, you will reduce on every day the, um, the, the presence of afflictions in your mind. Further, let's say that you're in a conversation uh, with someone in the office or at home or whatever, and they say something that is uh, hurtful for you. And when you find yourself upset, it's very important to remind yourself, I am a practitioner of the Lam Rim. I am following a path that will lead me to the state of enlightenment. It is unsuitable for me to be upset in this manner. It is unsuitable for me to get involved here in some conflict, conversation, and so forth. So reminding yourself that you are a practitioner of the Lam Rim even has this effect of uh, protecting you in this way. Obviously, if you practice like this in this life, it means you will work towards amassing the accumulation and you will work towards your purification. And that will have as a result a higher rebirth as a human or a god in your next life. So there it is. The Lamrim also benefits you in future lives. Once you have obtained this type of higher rebirth, this type of rebirth, higher rebirth, means you have more opportunities or you have continuous opportunity to practice the Dharma. So you can cultivate renunciation, you can cultivate compassion, you can gen cultivate bodhicitta, you can cultivate correct view, the three principal aspects of the path. You can um, further and further progress along the five paths and the 10 grounds and so forth. 
But it's uh, in incredibly important to understand that by listening, by reflecting, by meditating on all these Lamrim subjects, we place imprints in our mind. And those imprints are quite powerful. They make a great difference because they, they make difference in terms of how quickly we and how easily we will be able to eventually generate all these realizations in our mind stream. So it's uh, very important here to understand what is the role of uh, Lamrim. Sometimes there is the misconception that the only way to reach um, Buddhahood is uh, through the practice of the Lamrim. That is, oh, Lamrim Chemo or a specific Lamrim text. That is not the case. We know that, for example, uh, we have Lamrim presentation in all um, traditions. Uh, so we have it in the Geluk tradition, we have in the Kagyu, in the Nima, in the Saka tradition, everybody has their presentation of the Lamrim. We see that Lama Tsongkhapa has actually composed not one, but a number of Lamrim texts. So there actually there is actually a variety of presentation of um, Lamrim. But it is not that you can only reach the state of Buddhahood by relying on the Lamrim. There are so many other texts, so many other practices. For example, the Heart Sutra. You could rely on the Heart Sutra, the perfection of wisdom, and reach the state of Buddhahood. You could rely on the ornament of realization and reach the state of Buddhahood. You could rely on the five texts of Master Matuyea. They will lead you to the state of Buddhahood. So don't generate this misconception that there is only one a way to Buddhahood, and there's only one Lamrim text that will get you there. What we see with the compositions of uh, Jay Rinpoche is that he has prepared Lamrims of different lengths that suit very much our level, our disposition. We mentioned the perfection of wisdom, the ornament, the five texts of uh, Master Matuyea, but these are more suitable for those who have um, very sharp, very high intelligence. The texts of Lama Tsongkhapa are actually tailored much more to our level of intelligence, and they have a very suitable, very clear presentation, like all the stages of the path are very clearly presented in front of you. The Lama Tsongkhapa, the great uh, exposition, is... Um, is a very important text. It uh, it has recently been translated into English, but uh, you to look at its importance, you can see how early it was translated into Chinese. It was translated into Chinese prior to 1959. All right. So, of course, these days in the West, there is so much uh, interest in the Lam Rim and having the English translation. It is a text that is taught much more uh, quite often in the West. So um, anyway, the point is, don't think that in order to reach Buddhahood, you can only do it by relying on the Lamrim. Also, do not think that to obtain uh, the human body to reach Buddhahood, you can only do it as a Buddhist. This is not true. I mean, look around you. There are many other human beings in society they obtain the precious human body. They are not Buddhists. Obviously, they obtain it so through some other discipline, so through some uh, another religious system. And for this reason, it is very important that we show respect to all religious systems. They all have a system of ethics, discipline, paths to be followed that bring about those virtuous results. And by showing respect to various uh, uh, religious systems, this is how we can achieve harmony in society. Now, when we talk about achieving harmony in society, you have to understand that very much this depends on the way that you communicate, the way that you speak. Actually remaining silent, not engaging anyone in any con conversation is not helpful at all. Um, harmony, closeness, affection, all those things are developed through verbal communication, right? So it's important to speak to other people around you and to speak and communicate in a nice, uplifting, um, respectful manner. All right, so let us go into the essence of uh, refined gold um, it is a short commentary, um, 
that actually is a, a commentary to the lines of experience. It condenses the meaning of, um, you know, much uh, much longer commentaries that might run up for 500 pages and so forth. And um, it is extremely beneficial because it is short enough and uh, gives enough information. All right, so... Where did I put my text? Okay. Kishla, come on, check Sharona. Okay. So, um, all right. We are, um, as we say, we have done the preliminaries. And having presented the preliminaries, we are about to start with the actual training. And in that actual training, the first subject that is presented is the proper way to rely on the teacher. Then after that, we will talk about the precious human rebirth, how it is difficult to find and so precious. We will talk about refuge and uh, the law of cause and effect and so forth. And then eventually how we train in calm abiding and special insight and how we train to find uh, until we reach the state of enlightenment in um, Lamrim in the liberation in Lamrim Chenmo, we will see that here we have um, like two main outlines. The first outline says uh, the proper way to rely on the teacher, and the second outline following that is having relied on the teacher. How do you lead the student, or how is the student led along the path? Okay, so we are. Um, um, we are reading from page three. It talks, we have the heading here, the qualities of the spiritual teacher and a student. We have done this quotation from Jay Rinpoche. Um, so uh, it says right after the quotation, uh, however, through merely hearing the Lamrim teaching with the proper attitude, it's an extremely dynamic experience. It it is important to say something about the qualities of a Lamarim teacher. So we have said that, that there are actually great benefits and there are 20 types of benefits if you listen to the Lamarim. And um, from that point onwards, it says, okay, there are great benefits if you listen to these teachings, but you must understand a little bit about the qualities of the teacher. And then it says, in general, the qualities of the various teachers of the Theravada vehicle, Mahayana and Vajrayana methods are manifold. And any Buddhist master is a worthy teacher. Yet the specific qualities required for one who gives a discourse on the jewel-like Lamarim tradition are described in the ornament of Mahayana Sutras. So what we say here is obviously there are different teachers for different type of um, teachings. So you could have a Sutric teacher, you could have a Tantric teacher, you could have a Hinayana teacher, you can have a Mahayana teacher. And these different teach teachers need to have different um, qualifications. Mm. Okay, so as we say here, the um, we can have different qualifications for the teacher according to Sutra, according to Tantra, according to Vinaya, according to Mahayana, to Hinayana, and so forth. We have uh, various verses uh, in two occasions of the ornament of Mahayana Sutras that describe these uh, qualities. The general qualities of the Sutric teacher are described with uh, the verse that begins... Um, described in the ornament of Mahayana Sutra saying he should have realizations and so forth. Um, okay, so um, we also in the context of talking about the path of preparation, he talks about the external and internal qualities. When we talk about the qualities of uh, the Vajra teacher, they are mentioned, they are listed to be uh, a proficient in the 10 inner and the 10 outer should have the full list of 10 inner and outer qualities. Also in the 50 verses of uh, uh, how to rely on the teacher, uh, there is mention of the fully qualified teacher that must have the full list of 20 qualities. Further, when we talk about the teacher of the Vinaya, since in Vinaya, the most important thing is the training in ethics, there are lists of 13 and 15 qualities of the, that the Vinaya teacher should have. It might seem a bit confusing because there are many lists here with many qualities. However, it's very good to hear about those things because in this way, we develop the wisdom derived from hearing.
Okay, so it says here that uh, the specific qualities required for one who gives a discourse on the jewel-like Lamarim tradition are described in the ornament of Mahayana Sutras. He should have realizations, I, that is, his mind stream should, and then he gives an explanation. So let's read the actual verse from the ornament. It says, rely on a Mahayana teacher who is disciplined, serene, thoroughly pacified, has good qualities surpassing those of the student, is energetic, has a wealth of uh, scriptural knowledge, possesses loving concern, has um, thorough knowledge of reality and skill in instructing disciples, and has abundant dispiritedness. So these are the 10 qualities of uh, the Mahayana uh, teacher, and especially the Lamrim teacher. So it begins by saying that the teacher must be disciplined, serene, and thoroughly pacified. So depending on the translation, you might find some variation of these terms. However, these first three words indicate that the teacher uh, has the realization of the three higher trainings, which is the training in ethics, in concentration, and in wisdom, because these are the main means for subduing our mind. So the first one is the training of ethics. So when it says subdued, and as you can see in the commentary, be subdued through realizing the higher training of ethical conduct. When your speech and your physical activities are subdued, it means that you restrain your physical and verbal activities in a proper manner. Okay, so restrain your physical and verbal activities. It means you don't just say anything that comes into your mind. You don't, don't just uh, behave in this and that unruly manner, but instead you discipline your body and your speech. And by doing this, you will be able to induce or you have better conditions to bring about a virtuous state of mind. So through discipline, through the ethics of body and speech, we are able to bring about a mind that is now in the translation that we have for the refined gold, it says stilled in the uh translation I was reading from Lamrim Chinmo, it uses the word serene. Okay, so this refers to the training of concentration. So training of concentration in terms of your mind, it means you do not allow your mind to think about this and that and the other unrelated, irrelevant things, right? Rather, you want the mind to be subdued, to be serene, to be abiding on a virtuous focal object. Then the next that comes after that is the word thoroughly pacified or completely pacified that indicates training in wisdom. So in some explain that training in wisdom in having generated the realization of um, selflessness. Uh, however, training in wisdom in general you could say that it refers to training in the six in impermanence, the six um, types of the, the 16 aspects of the four noble truths, such as impermanence and so forth. Okay, so we talk about the three higher trainings that obviously they are presented in Lamrim and in other texts, but we have a sense of um, training in these three areas, also in everyday life, outside of Buddhism. All right. So first of all, we talk about training in ethics. Okay. So as we say, training in ethics uh, refers to restraining your physical and verbal activities. So in everyday life, we have a sense of what is appropriate and what is inappropriate, what goes against the law and so forth. So we have thoughts that tell us, oh, I shouldn't steal this, or I shouldn't say this, or I shouldn't kill someone, because if I were to be involved in any such activities, uh, there are consequences of the law. You know, the police would come and arrest me, and, you know, I have to go to the court and so forth. And that thought actually re makes us restrain from a certain type of physical and verbal activities. You might not call it ethics, but nevertheless, it's some form of restraint. 
The second one is the training in concentration. And we know that concentration is very important. Whichever type of activity, ordinary job, you have to carry out in the course of the day. Obviously, there are some activities or some jobs that you can do it with less con concentration than others. So, for example, if your job is just to sweep, do a little bit of sweeping, a little bit of cleaning. You could do it. You could do the sweeping whilst you're talking, you're carrying out a conversation. But if, let's say, your job involved climb, doing something where you have to climb very high up on the outer face of the building, right, where you are exposed, you're very high, you're at the top of the roof of the building, whatever job you would carry there, you would uh, not be distracted, you would not be having conversations right and left, you would try to do it with proper con concentration, because you are afraid you might fall, isn't it? So there is concentration in everyday life. And also there is training in wisdom. So for example, if you are investing, you are going to examine, you're going to analyze what is the best shares to buy or what is the best way to trade in order to have whatever profit according to your profit margins and things like that. So we go through, we understand these three types of training. Okay, we have explained the first three qualities. The fourth one, um, according to our commentary, is to have authoritative scriptural learning. That is, heard many teachings from the three baskets of scriptures and so forth through uh, from authentic teachers. Okay, so what we one of the qualifications of the teacher is uh, that they have received themselves, they have received a lot of teachings. So it, for someone to be a qualified teacher, it's not enough just to have, let's say, received some Lamrim teachings or some teachings on the ornament. Rather, they must have received extensive teachings from many different Lamas uh, on many different subjects. So they should have that wealth of education. Number four in the list is to have the wisdom realizing emptiness. So that's an interesting point. Obviously, if your teacher has direct realization of emptiness, then that person is fully qualified to be relied upon. But even if the teacher has a realization of emptiness through generic image, that also qualifies that person to be a suitable teacher to be relied upon. Okay, the next one. It says the teacher should have more learning and realization than the student. Obviously, the teacher should know more than the student. And that is true not only in the context of uh, teaching Dharma, but also in any school, right? In any classroom, you expect the teacher to know a bit more than the students. So as well as this uh, personal qualification of the Lamrim teaching, a lumbering teacher, he should have four altruistic attitudes. Awesome. Okay, so it is, uh, this is quite important that the teacher should have uh, higher training or more qualifications, more understanding than the student, because the teacher has the difficult role of having to discipline any unsuitable, unruly types of mind that exist in the mind of the student. So you understand from that, that if you have a student that is quite advanced, quite intelligent, they have to rely on a teacher who is capable to dealing with them. So Geshe was saying in the past, in like it happened in the monasteries, you know, we had to go and do work out in the fields. And um, there were, you know, there was the question like, uh, would um, everybody go? Would the teachers also go? The students would also go. Sometimes the students would uh, ask, become angry or ask questions of the teachers. Teachers would not be able to give them an the correct answer. They will become angry about that. Okay, so we have given so far a list of six qualities that are sort of like personal qualities of uh, the teacher. But uh, then it says, as well as these personal qualities of the Lamarin teacher, he should have four altruistic attitudes or four qualities that are necessary for the students, for others. And it begins by saying skill and spontaneous creativity in applying the methods to generate progress within the students. Okay, so this skill 
the fact that the teacher should be skillful is very important. And skill here means a skill in the presentation, in the words that they use, in the clarity with which they deliver the lesson. It could be the case that the teacher the themselves is a very educated person, has realizations and so forth. However, they have difficulty communicating those things. They don't know how to speak in a clear way, with a clear accent, for the right duration of time, in a way that it will be easily perceived, easily understood by the students. So, uh, knowing yourself is half of the job, but being able to communicate it skillfully to the students is very important. So for example, when you have a teacher that is very clear in their presentation, not only they know the subject, but they present it clearly with clear accent, with a correct rhythm in their speech. Um, let's say for the right duration of time, let's say 45 minutes, but every day with that stability. This is the best way to prepare your students. And you will see that at the end, when these students have exams, they will have no problem passing their exams because they are prepared properly. So in the past, uh, and as we know, within Dharma and also within secular education, there are many cases of people who know the subject, but they are not good communicators. So they're not skillful in how they express it. Yeah. It continues in this point, uh, talking about the teacher, he says, whom he teaches out of a pure motivation, free from grasping for wealth, fame, or power. So the important thing here is uh, the motivation that um, with which the teacher ca carries out the activity. So it says it should be pure motivation. The teacher should not be teaching with the expectation of fame, reward, uh, developing a big name, uh, reputation, and so forth. Instead, they should be motivated by pure uh, compassion and have great affection for the student. If they teach in this way, then it will be greatly beneficial for the student, but also for themselves. If they teach with wrong polluted motivation, not only it doesn't benefit the student, but it also becomes the cause of creating great negativity for themselves. We we'll continue with the next point where it says enthusiasm and joy in giving time and energy to teaching. So that, again, is a very important point. So you could be having many classes a day, like, you know, one group of teacher, of students come for one hour. When they finish and go, then another group of the students come in. They want to have teachings for another hour and so forth. Obviously, when you have like these successive classes in the course of a day, you might start feeling tired and say, oh, that is too much. I'm very tired. But it shouldn't like this. It shouldn't be like this. As it says here, the proper teacher should have this joy, this enthusiasm. So with every new group of students who come in, they should be enthusiastic and joyful and say, yes, I want to teach this with enthusiasm. The next point, diligence and perseverance in teaching. So obviously the teacher has to prepare for whichever lesson they do. They have to think, they have to look at different resources. Uh, they have to think about the presentation and so forth. So they should be diligent uh, in preparing for those teachings. The, the, the fourth, the last one of those altruistic qualities is beyond losing patience with students who practice poorly. So as a teacher, you have a number of students who attend your classes. It's not always the case that every student is a good student, that uh, they're respectful, they practice, they study hard, they practice properly and so forth. There are many students who do poorly. Um, even, you know, these days also it's quite common that uh, there is lack of um, respect for the teacher, they speak to the teacher in an inappropriate manner, they ask questions in an impolite way and so forth. Here, the, the important quality of the teacher is that they should never lose their patience with those students. They should have the attitude that I am here to teach them in order to benefit them in this life and all future lives. I am, whatever I'm doing is to benefit them so that I can lead them all the way to Buddhahood. So 
We know that when the teacher has these patience, doesn't give up on the students, um, this is very important, both in the sense of Dharma and in secular education. All right, so it says if you can find a group possessing these six personal and four altruistic qualities, then obviously you should respect, you rely upon them. Okay, so um, it uh, says here that if uh, you can find a guru possessing the six personal and four altruistic qualities, so that makes a list, uh, the full list of 10, request him for teachings and then follow them well. So that means if you find a teacher with the full list of qualities, then it is appropriate and it is suitable for you to rely, request teachings and rely upon whatever advice they give you. So um, here we can say that if you have find someone with all of, of the full set of qualities, you can refer to this being as being the guru that is kind in three ways. Kind in three ways is explained slightly different in Sutra and in Tantra. In Sutra, uh, a guru is kind in three ways if they have given you training, if they have given you transmission, and they have given you commentary. In Tantra, the guru is kind in three ways. If they have given you the initiation, the transmission of the, of the mantra, and the personal instruction. So we have uh, given here the list of these qualities. And sometimes people look at uh, teachers and say, well, one of the qualities was to have realization of emptiness. Hmm, I'm looking at this teacher and I wonder, do they have realization of emptiness? Or should I take this person as my teacher? So Gishler was saying, personally, for myself, from the very first class, I made it very clearly to you that I'm not here uh, as a virtuous spiritual teacher, the spiritual friend, right? I didn't say I have realizations. I said I can hardly explain what is the meaning of the essence of a refined gold. I can go through, let's say, skimming on the surface on the meaning of some of these words, but this is all I do. So I never presented myself as someone who has high realizations and uh, um, so forth, right? There are other great lamas who are... Um, you know, really, they have a very high level of realizations. You have the great opportunity to meet them, and they are fully qualified as uh, spiritual teachers. But also, um, what uh, Gesha was saying is that we have to be very careful when we raise these doubts, because often we uh, kind of like disqualify people due to our own doubts. So we look at someone, we say, mm, this person doesn't look like they have a realization, this realization or that realization. And this attitude of doubt is um, undermining our capability to accumulate or our opportunity to accumulate virtue. You have to, to keep in mind that even advanced bodhisattvas, bodhisattvas on the first ground, the second ground, and so forth, even up to the 10th ground, bodhisattvas have um, some sort of doubt or not doubt, but they don't have the full certainty of the level of, the, of their realization. It is when they reach the 10th ground that bodhisattvas are said to have the full confidence. So if this is true for bodhisattvas, how much more it is true for um, other beings who are not at the level of bodhisattvas, okay? The other thing that the Buddha has said is that you can only fully understand and judge those who are on the same level with you. Okay, and what that indicates is that um, often highly realized teachers will assume a very mundane, a very ordinary form that, you know, at first glance, you would look at this person and you say, <laughs> they know nothing, they have no realizations, they look like a beggar, they look like a nobody, I'm not relying on this person. Bring into mind the story of Asanga and how he met Matriya, he, the aspect of Lord Madriera was the aspect of that dog that was infested with maggots and so forth. So keep that in mind and don't be so quick to generate doubt and say, I'm not relying to this person because it doesn't look like they have realization of emptiness. And the other thing is that the Buddha taught 
different things according to the capacity of the samples. So the Buddha has taught the existence of the self to those who were suitable disciples for that type of teaching. Okay, so we have talked about the 10 qualities of the teacher. Now we will talk about the necessary qualities of the student. It says the student should have three fundamental qualities. The first one is sincerity. So sincerity here means to be honest, and that means you are not partial. To be partial means that you favor a particular group, and uh, you have a version for others. Also, to be sincere and to be honest, it means you are not going to visit a teacher uh, with suspicion, thinking, I think this teacher probably is full of mistakes. Let me go and check how many mistakes I find. Okay, so that's not sincere. That is not honest. The second quality of the student is intelligence, able to discriminate between beneficial and misleading forces on the path. So it is not the case that, that the student should accept and follow every word that comes out of the teacher, right? As we say, there are many different teachings. The Buddha gave many different teachings. The Buddha taught that there is a self. The Buddha taught Hinayana um, tenets, Hinayana practices. Uh, we are very fortunate that we had the great masters such as Nagarjuna and Asanga who actually clarified the teachings and made it differentiated and said, okay, this is definitive meaning, this is interpretative meaning, uh, and so forth. So the student also should be intelligent and analyze what the teacher says and understand, differentiate, find what is correct and what is misleading. And they should only follow and practice what is correct. Okay, so there is a story to illustrate this point. There was a teacher, he was, uh, um, he had many students, but he was getting on with age and he started thinking that he needed to choose one of his uh, students as his successor. He had someone in mind, but he didn't want to say in front of the class, I choose this person to be my successor. Uh, because the other students would um, generate jealousy. So he devised um, a scheme to uh, sort of like to show, to illustrate, to make, to make it evident who was the, the most suitable to succeed him, succeed him in leading other students. So one day the teacher says, okay, I want you all to go out and steal something. And at the end of the day, you come here with whatever you have stolen and we are going to decide who did best amongst you. So the students went out and some of them stole a yak, someone else stole a horse, someone else stole a pig, whatever they would get their hands on. There was one student who thought, no, wait a minute. Our teacher every day tells us to practice ethics. Every day the teacher tells us that to engage in stealing, to take other people's property and so forth is a negative action. Therefore, I am not going to engage in any stealing, and I don't care if I come class in this competition, stealing competition. <laughs> anyway, so at the end of the day, the, all the students came back, as we say, each one carrying whatever they were able to steal. So the room of the teacher was full of, you know, you know the, the teacher's house. There were yaks and horses and pigs and whatever, other all other things they had stolen. And um, the teacher looked at all this and he scolded them. And he said, can you, you know, have you lost your senses? Isn't it that every day I tell you that you should practice ethics, you should practice morality, you should uh, never steal from other people, right? So it was very clear who had the intelligence, who of the students had the intelligence to differentiate and to understand that this was just a test. That was not the real teaching. The real teaching was the consistent instruction to practice ethics, to practice morality, never to steal and so forth. Mm. Okay, we come to the third quality of the student. It says intense longing to gain spiritual understanding and experience. Um, 
And as well, he or she should have a fourth quality, appreciation for the Dharma and the teacher. So uh, intense longing to um, to gain inside, intense longing here is longing for the correct Dharma. So we just gave the example of uh, the teacher who wanted to test the students and gave them some misleading advice. And there was a student who was able to differentiate between the correct and the misleading and he chose to follow the correct advice. So when it says here, intense longing, this should be for the correct advice, to follow the correct advice. The next point, the next quality, additional qualities, appreciation and respect really for the Dharma and the teacher. So the, the Dharma is something which is very precious. And once you understand that the Dharma is precious, then you understand that the spiritual teacher is also someone who is very important in your life. And these two things deserve respect. We see, unfortunately, these days, especially in secular education, uh, people get, uh, let's say, they get some training, they get classes, they have a text they rely upon. And when the class is finished, they just put the text on the chair, they would sit on it, which is a great act of disrespect, isn't it? Um, so uh, by not having respect for the teaching, you um, have the danger of committing this seriously negative action of abandoning the Dharma. So this is something to be avoided. Um, as it says here, yeah, the student should have intense longing to gain spiritual understanding and experience. So whatever is taught in the Lan Rim, the student should have the interest to engage in the three trainings, in all the visualizations, all the different trainings, you know, just have that interest to engage the practice. So it says uh, um, sometimes six qualities are mentioned. The students fit to be led along the sublime path of the Lamrim practice must, number one, have great interest in the Dharma, which as we say, they, they should want to engage all this. Then the second point, during the actual teaching, be able to keep their minds alert and well-focused. So don't be in the classroom and allow, you, allow your mind to go out in the market, right? So, so just stay focused and disciplined in that class. Mm -hmm. The third point uh, says here, have uh, confidence in and respect for the teacher and the teachings. So the teachings is the teachings of Dharma and the teacher is the spiritual um, guide who gives you these teachings. The two important attitudes here is uh, faith and respect. It is translated as confidence and respect, but it's actually faith and respect. There is difference between these two attitudes. So, for example, we have respect uh, for our parents, our grandparents, the elders in the society. We don't necessarily have faith in them, but we have respect. Here, in terms of the Dharma and the teacher of the Dharma, we should have both faith and respect. So we're talking before about having faith and respect, and we make the differentiation. And Geshe also mentioned that we can have respect for all other religious systems, for example, Hinduism and uh, the Muslim tradition and so forth. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean we have faith in them, but we have respect. Okay, the next point is abandon wrong attitudes towards the teaching and maintain receptive ones. So very much this has been covered before, where we said that with intelligence, we should differentiate and find what is misleading, what is not appropriate, and what is of great value. And whatever we ascertain to be correct, to be of great value, then we should follow that fully and be open and follow that. Also, this, um, this expression to abandon wrong attitudes and maintain receptive ones, in some other texts, it is interpreted as saying intelligent enough to understand what is to be abandoned, the wrong attitudes, and what is to be taken on as a practice. So remain receptive to the practice. Okay, the last two in this list is maintain conditions conducive to learning and eliminate any unconducive conditions. 
And finally, the sentence that um, completes this section says, if you give a discourse on the Lamrim, try to maintain the qualities of a teacher described above. So this is instruction for the teacher. And actually, the teacher has great responsibility. Remember, we said the teacher must have a wealth of um, training themselves. They must have realization of emptiness. So it's a hard job <laughs> to act as a teacher of the Lamrim. And... Uh, then for the student, it says, if you listen to a discourse, cultivate the above qualities of an ideal student within yourself. So that means you should examine yourself and find out if actually you have any of those basic qualities that are required for a, a student, such as, for example, to be a sincere, to be honest, to have interest. Uh, to have respect and so forth. If you find that you are lacking some of those qualities, it is appropriate to make the effort to cultivate whatever qualities you are lacking. Okay, we will stop here for today at the bottom of page four. And if you have any questions, we can take them. All right, so there are no questions, but we can uh, conclude the class here. And Gesha was saying, I would like very much to thank everyone for coming back into our classes. We had a short break because we had all the activities of the Zerim. So thank you for returning back into the class. And I want you to consider um, how much better it is to come to the center, listen to some Dharma advice, listen to some Lamrim teachings, meet all the statues and the holy objects here. How much better is this compared to staying at home and just flicking through your mobile phone, isn't it? It is uh, much better in this way. Um, when we talk about practice of Dharma, we need to understand how that actually affects uh, the quality of our life on an everyday basis, right? When we look at the state of our mind, you know, you could be happy starting at the beginning of the day and uh, very quickly by lunchtime, you could be unhappy or by dinner time, you might have a catastrophe or, you know, something bad happened and so forth. No matter what happens through the course of the day, it's very important to cultivate the attitude that says, I can tolerate this suffering, I can take this on, I will practice the Lamrim, I will improve my mind, isn't it? If you actually consider uh, that there are so many living beings within cyclic existence and you compare your own suffering or your own misfortune to theirs, it will appear that your own suffering is something very small. These days in the West, it's very popular to engage in this um, type of um it's like some sort of analysis where you keep asking the questions, you know, uh, and how do you feel today? And how do you, what did you experience today? What is your particular problem? It's not necessarily how we uh, use the term in terms of uh, specific focusing or specific analysis in the Buddhist, you know, meditation or Buddhist tradition. However, even this level of investigation is quite useful. Sometimes you hear people's problem and you think, oh, you know, look at um, the husband has all these problems. I don't have any of those. Am I not fortunate? Or the wife has these problems and I don't have any of them. Or, you know, people in that country, they have this and this um, difficulty. And am I not fortunate that I am not there and I don't have these problems and so forth. So often by comparison, you can see it's quite useful to consider the suffering of others because this minimizes, um, let's say, the impact of um, whatever is going wrong in your own life right now.